Greetings, adventurers, and welcome back to the Den of the Drake. Other dragons hoard gold while I hoard internet cringe. Creating your own RPG system is no easy feat. You really gotta devote yourself to understanding the concept of game theory and what exactly goes into a fun role-playing experience. Trying to balance all of these things is something that I one day hope to do. But even with my experience in the world of Dungeons and Dragons, which really isn't much, literally my only qualification is that I have a YouTube channel. I know that I am nowhere close to being able to design my own RPG system. I mean, after all, D&D itself has found many ways to mess it up. But designing your own RPG system for the sole purposes of having an excuse to dunk on your friends? Well, that's some next level Tom fuckery. This might sound hypocritical coming from a red dragon. You know, the creature whose entire purpose in fantasy is to beat up nerds and take their lunch money. But using your position of power as a DM to bully your party into submission isn't a recipe for a long-lasting campaign. The story I have for you today stars a wannabe Gygax, who uses his position as a GM to abuse his players in spectacularly cringy ways, and how his defeat at the hands of a simp leads to the downfall of his own RPG. Now, without any further delay, let's go ahead and dive right into the horrifying world of r slash RPG horror stories. Enjoy. This week's story comes from user MissMeow989 and is titled The DM Who Bullied, Railroaded, Controlled, Exploited, and Had Everyone Else to Blame When Karma Came Knocking. Hello everyone! This post might end up a bit long, so I'll have to skip a little of the ridiculousness of this amazing GM. The server I will be talking about was a play-by-post on Discord. While there was a ton of different players, the main focus here will be on its creator and leader, the head GM. We will call him His Highness. His Highness had designed this tabletop RPG game, originally with two other friends, but had had a falling out with both of them, a trend that I soon realized was... constant. The idea was that this game was an amalgamation of concepts from all kinds of genres and popular shows, games, movies, all kind of meshed together in one town. There was no level up system, but rather you could earn skill points to learn all kinds of broken skills that would help you along your way. Your power was based solely on these skills along with overpowered items which were often made up on the spot and could literally be anything ranging from a holy hand grenade to Excalibur to a lightsaber. Basically, if it existed in a commonly known culture, it was likely in the game. It was the most unbalanced thing I have ever come across. Attacks automatically landed, and you always had at least two attacks. Without a level up system, your health was also fairly set at around 20 to 40, depending on your race. And often, weapons could do insane things such as 1d20 plus strength plus dex damage. It doesn't take a keen mind to find the issues. Despite this, I'm the kind of person who really likes roleplay over actual combat, so despite the already broken system I was walking into, I figured that something was better than nothing, right? Oh, how naive I was. His Highness would tell people that he was making the game. We were its beta players and would be helping him to create it. Yes, it had flaws, but don't worry. He would be fixing them. With that promise in mind, I made a vampire character whose focus was around taming monsters as pets, probably the most appealing dynamic to me, and I joined the game. The issues became apparent very quickly. Firstly, His Highness set up a Patreon which he insisted, publicly, would be an option for players who wanted to help support him in developing his game. If you donated monthly, you would not only be making it easier for him to focus his time on making his game better and more fair for everyone, but most importantly, it would give players more power in development. If you donated, then he would focus his energy on the areas that you wanted to see developed. An example, are you a magic player? Donating would mean that he would prioritize making new spells and items that worked for you. 
This was at least the promise. I found out later that he used the Patreon to pressure players. You didn't want your character to die? Well, a donating player wouldn't be targeted, and your character would be given better items to survive in his broken little sandbox of a world. What, you wanted to own a shop? That's fine, but if you want wares to sell, you had better be a patron, or else he would ensure a paying player would not only be given a shop, but the wares and funds to make your shop null and void. Oh wait, you're only donating $5 a month? Well, if you go up a tier and donate $10 a month, then your character can have... some plot. Because His Highness's time was very valuable, and you had better kiss his feet if he permitted you some of his time. Now, at this point, you're probably thinking, how did this guy have any players? The simple reason is that he wasn't on that much. He would usually only get on over the weekend and leave his other GMs to lead and maintain his game for him. He would usually only get on over the weekend and leave his other GMs to lead and maintain his game for him. Now, I came to find out that none of his GMs had any real GM experience, and that they were his friends in real life, and that he had used social pressure to control them. An example of this, he had these two ladies who worked as GMs. He would gaslight these two sweet ladies by telling them that he depended on them, that they were his close friends, and if that they didn't help him, the server would fall, and it would be all their fault. He would say that his other friends had abandoned him, but they wouldn't because they were true friends and that he could depend on them. Meanwhile, his highness would also tell them how he needed their help. He would regulate all of the server maintenance on them, have them run encounters with little to no guidelines. He would have them help new players and ensure they ran the world of RP, while he got on, eh, whenever he felt like it. If they, however, were not on every day? Oh, it was because they didn't care. They were going to leave him like so many others had. He had these two wrapped around his finger. Mind you, that Patreon only went to him. The GMs under him who, you know, did all the work, they didn't get anything. Uh, Drake? What are you doing? You're supposed to be providing commentary on the story. There's bigger things we need to worry about, buddy. I've discovered that we're all living in a simulation. Okay, but that doesn't explain what all of this is. Well, I've hit up my old wizard friend from Craigslist and he's helping me hone our skills so we can confront whoever is running the simulation on the outside. Hello, I am the wizard. I do wizard things. And how are you doing that? Glad you asked, little buddy. We're playing Quest Haven, the ultimate online role-playing experience, which is now live on Kickstarter. Quest Haven's easy-to-use world builder uses thousands of models with tens of thousands more to come. The ability to don a VR headset and see the world through my figure's eyes will allow me to hone my magic so I can take on whatever the lizard men on the outside can throw at us. Plus, with Quest Haven's new character creator, I can create a figure that finally looks how I feel on the inside. And it's not just for VR either. I can comfortably put my sick gamer skills to work from the comfort of my PC that runs on only a potato battery and wishful thinking. What's wrong with creating a potential fire hazard when I can do this? Wow. The only thing you're missing is the tinfoil hat. Oh, thanks for reminding me. And that's not all. Quest Haven has got some fat customization options. Whatever world building elements are rattling around in your DM brain can seamlessly be brought to life in Quest Haven. There's never been a homebrew friendly world builder as flexible as this. I don't know about you, Drake, but I just fucking love dice. Especially Kickstarter exclusive dice. The incredibly attractive people who have backed Quest Haven on Kickstarter get access to exclusive sets of dice that can be acquired nowhere else. That's right, wizard. Speaking of Kickstarters, the Quest Haven Kickstarter is almost over. Click the link in the description to get your hands on Kickstarter exclusive rewards and have a hand in crafting the future of tabletop RPGs. Link is in the description. All right, the coordinates are set. I'm ready to leave the simulation when you are. Don't worry, little buddy, we'll be back soon. Try not to miss us too much. 
I won't. Hey, you. You're finally awake. You Back right to the simulation. Uh-huh. Right? Walked right into that Imperial. <laughs> Same as us. My character was a sweet little vampire who could literally befriend even the most intense edgelord. She got along with everyone, and as a result, it wasn't long before I got to know most every one of the players, including the other GMs. The other GMs, as previously mentioned, didn't know how to lead, and I was not only friendly and liked, but also quite experienced. They would message me asking how to do things, since His Highness would sometimes take days before responding, if he even bothered. I started helping to run things and even playing other NPCs to help keep the game progressing. Obviously, His Highness was not happy. He became upset that I was leading things without his permission, and even wanted to take away my happy little character as punishment. Needless to say, literally everyone turned on him. We had GMs threatening to leave, which, since he wasn't on that much, meant that he wouldn't have anyone to lead his server for him. In the end, he begrudgingly asked me to be a GM, and put me in charge of the black market, one of the few jobs he hadn't already relegated to someone else. This is important because this meant that I was in charge of running his favorite NPC character, the black market's leader who was a powerful demon. We all just call this character the OP Demon Dude. I read and reread every note that he had on the characters and the black market as a whole so that I could run them the best I could. This fact will be important later. Now, as a GM, I was privy to the GM chats and took part in a weekly meeting. During those meetings, he would assign tasks for the others to do and set up what he called upcoming story. Essentially, it was just side missions since the game didn't really have much of an overarching plot. Most of his stuff revolved around trapping a group of players in a place for a week and giving them a single hard battle to resolve. Most of the time, that battle would be retconned by one of his overpowered NPCs or a single item that he had given a player that he favored. This wasn't the worst of it, though. I also realized that the DM would try to plan player death he would purposefully target a player that he felt needed to die. Usually because their player upset him in some kind of way, they stopped donating on Patreon, or because he had given them an overly broken item and now he couldn't easily take them down. For example, he gave someone armor that basically absorbed all damage. So his answer to his own sloppy mistakes? Kill the character or force that item away from them somehow. Brilliant GMing, take notes, guys. The final straw for everyone came when he railroaded the death of my character. My little vampire loved taming creatures, and had tamed a creature that the DM had once said had the chance to turn into a very dangerous and uncontrollable monster if it grew too powerful and leveled up too much too quickly. Well, I had it for one week. After spending all of my hard-earned in-game money on the device to catch it, think really weak and overpriced Pokeballs, I roleplayed training it for an IRL hour each day along with playing with it, and overall trying to develop my character's bond with the little necrotic monster. After that first week of intense and long RP, His Highness graced me with the knowledge that it had leveled up to level 2, and that I needed to roll a percentile roll. I roll 7. 7 out of 100. Well, His Highness was not all that upset, or forgiving. His voice suddenly gets a cold twist to it as he says, Okay, well, this will be fun. I hope you're ready to face the consequences. With that ominous bit, His Highness put the entire game on hold for 30 minutes while he, I kid you not, made up stats and other things for this evolving level 2 monster. Finally, 30 minutes passes and all of the other players are reasonably confused. What is going on? Why is gameplay stopped? Why is His Highness cackling and acting so excited? Finally, the wait ended. I'll narrate this bit to the best of my ability, since by this time we were all on voice call. He really did sound like this, by the way. His Highness, 
Okay, so, <laughs> what you don't know is that this is one of the most dangerous monsters alive when it evolved. Me. It had five health and did 1d4 damage and is level two. How? His Highness. Well, when they evolve, they become their true form. It doesn't matter what level they were before. This was basically a baby. Me. But, His Highness. Okay, so, it transforms into this female humanoid with dark black eyes. It looks just like your character, but the evil version because it spent so much time with you. Me. I had it for one week. His Highness. Now, everyone in town has to make a wisdom save. Me. Oh, phew. My wisdom is my best stat. I built more of a caster type and had an audibly relieved air about me. His Highness. Well, no. You don't get one because you're right next to it. More players than he expected pass the check, and His Highness proclaims to his plebeians, Um, actually, since this thing is a lord of the undead, anyone with the undead subtype can't pass the save and fails right away. Q3 players now auto-failing despite having rolled successes. May I remind you, he was making this all up and had no notes on this thing. I knew because I was a GM and had read through everything that he had made. His Highness. Okay, so, now if you failed the save, you are all walking towards the monster and are under its full control. If anyone comes close, you will be attacking them. Me. Well, um, can I try to break free? His Highness. It reaches out and touches you. Your life drains away. Make your first death save. Me. I... okay... Next thing I know, I am making saves. And according to him, cannot stabilize because it will just touch me again if I do. So, I'm dying. Any player not mind controlled is at this point trying to get close to save my vampire. His Highness will certainly not let this happen, however. Here is what the players try and the response. Mage player. I try to run in and grab her body to drag her out of its reach. His Highness, her body is floating out of reach, and you can't get close. However, it attacks with necrotic damage. Take 4d6 necrotic damage. Mage player, well, I have 9 health left. His Highness, you better run before it attacks you again. Werewolf player, I have the jump skill. I can jump up to grab her. His Highness, there's a fourth field keeping you away. Take 4d6 necrotic damage. Tech player. Can I use this teleportation device I have been saving? Maybe I can try to get the monster away. His Highness. No, the monster's power deactivates it. Then His Highness sighs. Though we can still hear the glee in his voice. You black out and are dead. By this point, I feel not only mentally defeated, but close to a breakdown. Me, in a small voice, as literal tears start to fall. Okay. His Highness pauses, probably realizing that he's gone too far. Hey, I, I want to take a moment to make sure that you're alright. Me, utterly defeated. Please, just don't kill anyone else. I'm fine. His Highness. Alright, let's get back to it. He pauses, having realized, hopefully, his error, and states, So, your teammate, a player who is not online, flies in with the Millennium Falcon, long story, and crashes into it. Everyone breaks out of the trance as the monster is gone. Other players ask if that offline player is killed from literally crashing a spaceship into the monster. His Highness. No, he's fine. I rolled the fee how he did, and he rolled high, and was able to crash safely. Now let's go back to roleplaying in a normal server. Well, big surprise, the entire Discord community was beyond pissed. Oh my god, this. This is some top tier crap. Obvious railroading aside, the part that pisses me off the most is the I hope you're ready to face the consequences part. Motherfucker, if I adopt a cat, I'm not lying awake at night worried that it's going to evolve into fucking Cthulhu. 
One thing that D&D advice YouTubers, including myself, like to prattle on about is making sure that your players' actions have consequences, when it really should be make sure that your players' actions have realistic and somewhat predictable consequences. There is never a scenario where just insta-killing your players in ways that they could have never seen coming is ever going to provide a game-enriching experience. Wow, DM! That was so cool when the character whose backstory I spent a week writing and a year playing just got deleted by that hamster who actually ended up being a disguised Dracolich. It really made me respect your world building and appreciate the danger can be around every corner. F off. There are ways to make your world seem dangerous without making yourself look like a sadistic twat whose parents didn't love them enough. The most effective way to show the consequences of a dangerous element of your world is to show the aftermath of how others have interacted with it. Let me lay out an example. Way back in the day, when cavemen first started foraging for food, there had to be some who tried eating mushrooms for the first time and an unlucky few found out that some mushrooms are poisonous. The cavemen who witnessed this event said to themselves, Hmm, me no eat red mushrooms because they make friend Thragnar go to cave in sky. That second caveman learned to recognize and appreciate the danger of the red mushroom. But now what did the first caveman learn? Nothing, because he's f***ing dead. And I'm willing to bet that if that caveman had a player, they would be pretty damn pissed about what happened. Over the next two days, I stayed offline and honestly just needed to not focus on what felt like the unfair murder of my player character. I chose not to talk to anyone else, with the exception of those two sweet GM girls, bless their kind selves, supporting and standing by me. Through them, I found out that His Highness was getting angry messages from literally everyone, even players that no longer played. What did he do? What was his well-thought-out and adult response? We were all being overly sensitive and that he had given everyone a chance to save my character because... She should have died before the battle even started. It got to the point where he called me on the phone to demand why I was complaining about his choices as a DM and to tell me that I was not respecting his leadership. I told him that I was not talking to anyone else and that I had stepped away from my own mental health because I had broken down emotionally. Literally something I have done only one other time in my entire life and I was not ready to speak to him at length. He then called my husband his biggest and best mistake. Here is where karma came to fight, with both guns blazing. See, my husband, who was also a player in the game, and an ex-marine. He is also a fantastically supportive and good man, as well as possibly just a tiny bit flipping amazing. His Highness tells my husband that the server is turning on him, and that he's worried that without support the entire thing will end. Well, husband suggests to His Highness that if he really wants to save the server, that he can help. As long as His Highness does exactly what he says. Husband has the perfect way to save the situation. In game, some players speak with a time-related NPC. That is the master over time travel, etc, etc. And the time NPC tells them, You can bring her back from the dead. However, to save a life that is meant to be lost, time still has to have a death to balance it. Someone else, more powerful and dangerous, must die in her place. OP Demon Guy, aka His Highness's favorite NPC and leader of the black market. Now, I will say this. I discovered all this later because at this point, I'm not playing. His Highness, under my husband's prompting, has agreed to this whole thing because, according to him, it will take players a month to kill him. He is incredibly powerful and I will make sure it is super hard and that no one will get to him. Little did he know, but a group of vengeful players, including husband and those two GMs, had stayed up for 24 hours straight in a state of rage and coffee-induced insanity. Scheming. The next day, one of the new players, let's just call him Simp, though he was a sweet guy, he was just, well, a simp, 
tells his highness in private that he wants to speak to the OP demon guy. His own character was a demon, and OP demon guy had been working to recruit him for a while. And his highness, likely desperate to get someone on his side, agreed. Now here is where it gets fun. Like I said before, there were a few things working in the player's favor. To recap, 1. His Highness was barely online and never read the RP, so didn't know that in-game Simp had been equipped for a suicide mission. 2. Simp was like a brother to my vampire, and had even pursued her romantically, though had been shut down. Thus Simp was very much on board with dying to save her. 3. Simp was good at following instructions. Simp was shown into the black market and is told, His Highness, Security theme increased, but you are recognized by the guards and shown inside. You are led upstairs to OP Demon Guy's private office. When you go in, you see him through a portal battling a massive centipede monster. He strikes it with his flaming sword, easily slaying it before he steps out of the portal and walks over to you with a smile. Simp. I wait until he gets close. I look very nervous. His Highness. His muscles are gleaming from sweat on his body. He looks like he's been working out and walks all the way up to you. Simp. I pull out a thermal detonator from my pocket and activate it, blowing myself and OP Demon Guy up. His Highness goes silent for about one full minute. Finally, he asks where Simp got the thermal detonator. Of course, he hadn't read that in-game, in the channels, and in full view of the rest of the players and GMs, the characters had discussed and given Simp a weapon that His Highness had put into the game. This weapon was a thermal detonator, a bomb which exploded instantly once activated and once before had been used by His Highness to obliterate an entire channel. His Highness had in the past said that this weapon could go through any defenses, any magic, and any shields. It would destroy anyone within its radius and leave a smoking crater behind. Karma had come in the form of a simp, and His Highness's poorly made overpowered weapons. A deadly combo. His Highness was emotionally distraught. He first began to argue, saying that cheating had occurred. His other GMs, namely the ladies who he had bullied and gaslit, stood firm. They showed the in-game RP. They showed where the weapon had come from, and they told him that OP Demon Guy was dead, through fair RP with full evidence. After that, His Highness had a day of silence for the lost NPC, but then proclaimed that OP Demon Guy had actually not even been there. He was an illusion, and apparently often used illusions when meeting with people. Well, having read and reread every scrap of black market info since, you know, I let it, this claim did not hold any water. Soon after, His Highness called me on the phone to tell me about how I had destroyed his game, how I had spread lies and hate, and had the other players get revenge for me for his GM choices. I told him that he didn't have to worry that I was leaving. His server fell apart within a week, and they say that if you pay close attention, the illusion of OP Demon Guy is still out there somewhere, flexing his sweaty muscles. End of story. Well, that was certainly satisfying. Between the blatant scamming, narcissism, and railroading, you think that this entire RPG he made was created by Ubisoft. When acting as a DM, you should do your best to avoid making your campaigns like a Ubisoft game. I get it, you want me to pick the fucking flower. And instead, be more like Elden Ring. Let your players make their own adventure and put their agency first, and maybe beat them up a bit if their hubris outpaces their caution. Now before we go, let's take a look at this week's Gallery of the Drake. This week's fan art comes from viewer Salty Fox Prince, and depicts a vibrant scene of me perching upon my noble throne. It truly is a throne fit for a dragon, and is definitely not the chair given to me as a part of my court-ordered rehab program. 
Hello, my name is Drake, and I'm addicted to cringe. Hi, Hi Drake. Drake. I'm sorry to interrupt, Drake, but according to my sheet, that isn't why the judge sent you here. Could you please start over following the court's instructions? Uh, hello, my name is Drake, and I'm addicted to ketamine. Thank you again, Salty Fox Prince, for submitting your art. If you want to see your artwork featured in Gallery of the Drake, be sure to send it to the email in my About section. I love receiving and reviewing fan art, and it means the world to me that my content inspires artists like you to create artwork like this. With the story over and artwork displayed, we're going to go ahead and wrap up. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And if you feel like supporting the channel further, my Patreon is in the description. I would like to thank you all for listening, and I hope to see you next time in the Den of the Drake.